Welcome back to the Lars Larson Show. It's a pleasure to be with you on a Tuesday. I'll get back to your calls and emails shortly. Frank Gaffney joins me now, founder and president of the Center for Security Policy. And Frank, before we get to North and South Korea, you know there's been some talk about President Donald Trump getting the Nobel Peace Prize. And as much as I, I believe in President Trump and I voted for him and I endorsed him, does anybody really want a prize that's also gone to Yasser Arafat and Barack Obama? Well, the last time I checked, I think there's something like a million dollars that goes along with it. So probably, yes. And that's walking around money for Donald Trump. That's just Trump. Well, that's Trump true. Change. That's, that's true. But he's, 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 he's getting a government dollar a day deal now. So maybe he'd think of it as just compensation. Well, in fact, listen, I, I, he, he certainly deserves it more than all of the rest of them combined. As he far does. As he, even, he, even with uh, mission not quite complete on a couple of scores, but uh, so far so good. Maybe I should advance the theory that the Nobel Committee, having screwed up badly in some of the people it's given the Nobel Peace Prize to, is trying to rehabilitate its own image by giving one to Donald Trump, who actually may end the Korean War, may uh, be able to denuclearize the uh, the Korean Peninsula. But let's get to talking about this. Is South Korea trying to do a deal that will undercut the work of the United States uh, with North Korea? Well, the answer to that question is related, actually, to the last point you just made. I, I can't conceive of the Nobel Prize Committee giving Donald Trump anything, <laughs> even if he solved world peace problem, you know, uh, let alone the Korean Peninsula. But the guys who are, I think, you know, uh, the real wild card in whether there is going to be peace on the peninsula, um, well, the two of them, really, the, there's the South Koreans, who uh, it seems in their um, – well, warm embrace doesn't begin to describe it, does it? Uh, no. Their enthusiasm, their slavish uh, commitment to Kim Jong-un and North Korea are are really putting, I'm afraid, um, probably uh, a little bit more uh, than they should in terms of uh, the sense that Kim Jong-un has that maybe, just maybe, he can get away with the same kind of flim-flam that he and his predecessors have engaged in vis-a-vis the West, so that he doesn't actually have to denuclearize. He doesn't actually have to, you know, uh, beat his uh, pl- uh, swords into plowshares and all the rest. Uh, the other party that is a wild card in all of this is the Chinese. And as we've talked about before, Lars, there, of course, would be no North Korean regime if it weren't for the Chinese. We keep telling ourselves, oh, they're our partners. No, they're not our partners. They have enabled this regime, they have actually built up its threat to us. And just one example of that, very quickly, you've, I've now seen the pictures of those big missiles driving around Pyongyang uh, for the entertainment of uh, Kim Jong-un. Well, some of them are increasingly long-range and and may even be capable of reaching this country. Uh, They're driving around, not just on trucks, they're driving around on what are known as transporter erector launchers. And what that means is they're devices that can take those things anywhere, basically, and then erect the missile into a firing position and launch it from that uh, tell, as they call them. Well, the thing is, that means those missiles are very, very difficult to track and to counter, uh, you know, preemptively, if you needed to do that. But more to the point, Lars, those tells are all provided by communist China. Yep. So think about the threat we're facing from North Korea. It is made in China in no small measure. So those are the things that are working against Donald Trump. I I certainly wish him well, and I I think he's made the right sorts of uh, signals about how he's not going to go if this isn't the real deal, denuclearization or nothing, and he's going to leave. If once he gets to wherever they're meeting and it turns out it's just more of the same. So those are the right sorts of signals to be sending. And I'm delighted that he's got Mike Pompeo with him now and and John Bolton, of course, and and others that they're pulling in, um, because I think we're now finally getting an A team, which is what this president has needed all along and didn't have until now. You know, Frank, I have to tell you, having heard your comments on the Nobel uh, and I and I think you're right about China and its backing of of, uh, North Korea. But. If we all think, a lot of us conservatives think that the Nobel Peace Prize has become a joke because of its prior recipients, 
if Donald Trump pulls off a deal and doesn't have to walk away from the table, but actually says, yeah, there's a deal here that will get us somewhere down the road towards something better than the situation we have with North Korea right now, uh, and then they don't give it to him, it will solidify, it will concrete in place the idea that the Nobel Peace Prize is a joke to have gone to Yasser Arafat and Barack Obama, but not to somebody who actually makes some accomplishments. Let's talk about Michigan and what's happening in Michigan with regard to Sharia law. Uh, we've been watching the state for a while. Dearborn is a you know, large Arab population, uh, and, and it's unfriendly to a lot of Christians who go there to try to hand out leaflets and to proselytize. Uh, has Sharia law inf- infiltrated Michigan? Well, you know, th- just to define terms for a moment, sure. Lars, uh, Sharia, of course, as you know, is uh, often described as law, but it, it's really um, a, a much more comprehensive program. It's it's by its adherents' own definition, the path. It is a whole way of life for those who believe it's God's will that they not only practice um, what I think is objectively a totalitarian, brutally repressive program, but that they impose it on everybody else. Uh, that program goes beyond law. It it is political in character. It is military in character. And Sharia, yes, unfortunately, and Sharia supremacism, more to the point, is very much present in Michigan these days and elsewhere in the United States as well. The issue has been joined in Michigan, however, because one candidate for governor has pointed out that another one seems to have a certain affinity for all of this. Uh, it certainly has got ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is really the vanguard of Sharia supremacism uh, in this country. So uh, the, the fat is now in the fire. There are a lot of people who are saying, well, you can't talk about this, or, or there isn't anything to talk about, or you know, you're an Islamophobic bigot if you do. Um, but the truth of the matter is the debate is beginning, and it needs to be informed and joined, not because it's Islamophobic or we want to offend anybody, but because this doctrine of Sharia and the effort to impose it on a lot of people who just as soon not have it <laughs> imposed on them is anti-constitutional. And the stealthy way it's sort of insinuated and, uh, and advanced and that we're induced to accommodate it is a real national security problem uh, in Michigan and indeed elsewhere. Well, tell us about the intersection of Abdul El Sayed and Senator Patrick Kolbeck, who's a state senator in Michigan. Well, these are the two gubernatorial candidates I was mentioning. Uh, Senator Patrick Kolbeck is a state senator from Michigan, um, probably uh, a fairly unlikely candidate uh, to to actually prevail. But he has pointed out uh, that this uh, Democratic candidate, Abdul El Saeed, uh, who is um, a very presentable guy, uh, very suave, uh, person of uh, educational credentials, a PhD, a medical doctor, um, very well spoken, uh, is uh, unfortunately a guy who does have some worrying ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, hasn't acknowledged them as best I can tell, and certainly hasn't disavowed them. And to the extent that that's in the mix here, in a state that has a large and aggressive Population you mentioned, Dearborn. Yep. Uh, some people have actually said it's a no-go zone. Uh, it's it's a problem, and the the rest of the mission directors need to address it, understand whether that's where they want to continue going or not. Yeah. And, uh, that's I think going to be the backdrop for hey, all of this. Frank, thank you very much. Frank Abney is the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy.